Okay, so we are recording at this moment. What we're going to do is we are going to finish up with GI physiology today, start endocrinology. Uh, what I've given you right now, um, Magna just passed this out. Uh, this is your final case study. Um, you can just send it to me, scan it. You can keep a copy of it. I just need it by Friday. So I don't need it just, you know, on, on Wednesday. Um, what it is is it's just to help you organize the material. Okay, so that's the main thing here. There's a lot of hormones we're going to be going through. I want you to be able to, and flashcards are perfect for this exercise, okay, to study for the exam. It's going to be very over the plate. I just need you to know the name of the hormone, where it's coming from, okay, what's its source, what cell types are secreting these hormones, what are the target cells, where is it traveling to, what receptors are they activating. You actually don't know, have to know the receptor name. But I do want you to know the target cell, what their action is, and then any diseases that I talk about in class that are associated with that particular hormone. All right, so again, this is just a nice table. I can put out an Excel spreadsheet too to help you if you want to expand upon it, but this is just a way to organize the material, okay? Any questions about that? Question? question just yeah. to confirm the alcohol and digestive tract case study, is that due Friday also? Friday also, okay? So I wanna give you a little bit of extra time to go through this material. You'll actually be needing some of the information for the exam that's scheduled on December 14th. Okay, so I've been making this announcement every single day, but I wanna make sure everybody knows this information. The first opportunity to take the exam is December 14th. That is a Saturday. It, it will be in this room between 1.30 and 3.30, okay? This room, 1.30 to 3.30. Um, the first hour is devoted to the fourth midterm, the final. And the second hour is devoted to the retake. On Wednesday, you need to be in class. I will have a top hat question so that you will sign up for your uh, date and time that you're going to be here. Uh, you don't have to be here on the same day. You can do the final on Saturday and the retake on Tuesday. I will give you the opportunity to sign up for that on Wednesday, this Wednesday in class. All right. The second opportunity to take the final exam is Tuesday, December 17th, between, again, 1.30 and 3.30, so that's easy to remember. It's the exact same time, but this time it is in B45 Rattan Hall. I have scheduled that uh, space. All right, any questions about the final or the retake? All right, last night I actually put a um, video it's the acid base regulation video. Finally got that out, got it to where I want it. Um, there is a five uh, point quiz associated with it. Because I didn't get this out uh, earlier, there will be no questions on the final exam that will be required. All right, so you don't have to study for that material. You do have to take the quiz, but these questions won't be on the final exam. There will, however, be an extra credit opportunity during the final exam. So if you do want to study and try that extra credit opportunity, I'm going to uh, give you that, that uh, case study during the final exam, okay? Anybody have any questions about what I just explained? All right, you're not required to study for that material for the final exam, but there will be an extra credit opportunity pertaining to that material. All right, clear, cool. All right, so um, any other questions so far? I did have a good question about the video project. A lot of people have been asking me about their video project. Um, one question is, do all of us have to speak in the video? No, not necessarily. If uh, one person did all the research and wrote up all the script or uh, basically edited, um, you don't have to speak in the video, okay? There will be a self-evaluation that will be passed out. Again, that's due December 18th. You will document your role in the group video project and basically everyone else's role, okay? 
So this is my opportunity to see if your group members never got a hold of a particular person and that person never contributed. We need to be able to flesh that out as well. Okay, any questions about the group video project? Sweet, all right. Well, let's go ahead and get started on the material then. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, GI physiology where we left off. Last time we were talking about diarrhea. All right, great stuff. Um, now we're gonna move into the large intestines. We're gonna be talking about anatomy, motility, digestion, and absorption, just like we talked about with the small intestines, okay? Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to stop me as I'm speaking. All right, so uh, here we go. This is the anatomy of the large intestines. We have the ileum, that's the last part of the small intestines here. Moves right into the cecum and the appendix. A lot of times the cecum for some uh, animals actually has a lot of bacterial load to help digest food. Uh, the appendix is um, basically an organ that is uh, thought to not have a function at this point. Uh, it used to, but evolved into a vestigial organ. Um, then the colon actually has this ascending limb, this ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, then we move into the sigmoid colon, the rectum, and then finally the anus. Right? This is the last part of the alimentary canal that I mentioned early on in the intro to GI physiology section. Okay, so you'll also notice that um, they have these little pouches. We're going to talk about hostra in just a second. Okay, so in the large intestines, active transport of sodium coupled with osmotic absorption of water are the primary activities. And there are a lot of microbes within the colon that are actually active in the production of vitamin K. So I want to mention vitamin K. Um, I'm not sure if they still give shots to newborns with vitamin K, um, but I know when my daughter was born in 1992, that was a while ago, um, they whisked her away and gave her a shot right in her heel, which made her wail. And, oh, they do. They still give shots of vitamin K. Um, and uh, it was very traumatic for her and me. And so I remembered this. This is a really important, um, didn't know why they were doing it at the time. But now I know that vitamin K is a very important vitamin that actually helps with blood clotting. So uh, for, um, and microbes are the ones that actually produce the vitamin K. So newborns actually don't have any microbes in their intestines when they're first born. So they're not producing vitamin K. Okay, so that's why they give them the shot right when they're born. Um, again, if you, uh, some babies that don't get the shot actually can uh, have something called, can come down with something called hemorrhagic disease of newborn. Okay, so again, vitamin K is really important in blood clotting, um, and it's the microbes in your colon that are responsible for the production of vitamin K. All right, so moving on, let's take a look at, now this is the motility in the large intestines. Okay, so let me just review for a minute. When we talked about the small intestines, we actually talked about three types of motility, segmentation, peristalsis, and migrating myoelectric complex. So if you don't remember that or you haven't seen that material before, go back and take a look at the video. Um, it is in there. So now I want to focus on the motility in the large intestines. Okay, there's two types that I'm going to go through. Now remember uh, the large intestines morphologically, you can distinguish this from the small intestines because they have these large pouches, okay? These pouches are called hostra. Here's the word for it right here, hostra. And they actually contract, okay? They do have smooth muscle that surround them. And when each of the different uh, hostra contract, um, this is a process known as hostration. Hostration. And the way I think about it, I always like to be colorful when I talk about this. 
this is about packing that poop, okay? <laughs> it's kind of like making a mud pie, all right? So the hostra actually contract, and what they're doing is they're packing that feces, all right? So think about mud pies and, and packing a mud pie, all right? So that's a process called hostration. The next one is mass movement, all right? So again, being a little colorful this morning, everybody has experienced a mass movement, all right? This is almost uh, leading into that urge to go number two, all right? So what you have is here, I'm going to give you some orientation. This is the ascending colon, and this is the transverse colon. And the idea here between uh, that constitutes mass movement is basically there's a simultaneous contraction of the colonic circular smooth muscle here. So you get contraction in the ascending limb and at the same time distal relaxation in the transverse, uh, in the transverse colon. Okay, so that helps to push the feces down the line. Okay, and it also kind of gives you that uh, sensation of that urge to go. Okay, this is called mass movement. All right, so those are the two types of motility associated with the colon. Now let's talk about the defecation response. This is the last, um, this is the last slide before we get into appetite, which I'll go into in just a second. Um, I do need to, you to know something about the defecation reflex. All right. So um, just like when we talked about the sphincters, uh, when we talked about micturition, um, basically what you see here is you also have an external and internal anal sphincter similar to what we talked about with the urethral sphincters, with the, the bladder and the urethra. All right, so you have two types, the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. All right, so the defecation response, this is really important. Again, I always like to kind of give you a heads up on what a question could be on the final exam. The defecation response starts with a stretch of the rectum. That's how it's initiated. It starts with a stretch of the rectum. These little symbols right here, again, are mechanoreceptors. So they are detecting the stretch in the rectum. Now this is a true reflex. So it sends a signal by these mechanoreceptor afferent fibers directly to the spinal cord right, which then sends a signal to the sigmoid colon to contract, okay, contract and relax, right, in kind of a rhythmic way. So that helps to push some of the feces back into the rectum area, and that's where you really feel that urge to go. Now, the internal anal sphincter is not under your control. This is an involuntary response. It's actually under sympathetic nervous system control. So with the initiation of the defecation response, the internal anal sphincter will relax. But nothing should happen, nothing should happen until you voluntarily relax the external anal sphincter. And again, this is something that you learned when you we're potty trained many, many years ago, okay? So you are controlling the external anal sphincter. It's under skeletal muscle control. You voluntarily relax that external anal sphincter. Now, not to be gross or anything, but if it's not convenient for you and there's not a bathroom nearby, you actually may contract that external anal sphincter and what that does is it actually pushes feces back into the sigmoid colon and then it relaxes, okay? So there's another mechanism involved uh, with that. Pretty good? All right, all right. So that is the defecation uh, reflex 
Again, this is a true reflex. It actually just goes to the spinal cord and back. All right, any questions? Everybody pretty good? All right, so let's go ahead and go to appetite. This is the last of the GI physiology lectures. There's only two slides here that I'm going to go through. In fact, um, I actually am going to um, postpone this one until we get to the endocrinology section because we will be talking more about insulin, glucagon, and uh, glucocorticoids in a different capacity. So I will save this last slide for the endocrinology section. Just know that they're both tied together, all right? Just as we talked about GIP secreting cells, GIP stands for glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptides, okay? And that those cells detect glucose in the small intestines, sending a signal to the pancreas to release insulin, okay? All right, so let's focus on this particular slide first. All right, there are three hormones that control appetite by binding to receptors in the hypothalamus. So let's just make sure that we have some orientation here. This is in the brain, the hypothalamus in particular, and I do want you to know these three hormones. All right, the first one is leptin. Leptin is actually secreted by white adipose tissue. And I'll get to the mechanism in, in just a second, but what I want you to know is leptin is a signaling molecule that suppresses appetite. Suppresses appetite. All right. Ghrelin, on the other hand, is secreted by the stomach. It is a hormone. And ghrelin actually increases appetite. And then peptide YY is coming from the colon, and it also suppresses appetite. All right. Um, so let me just go through some of the mechanisms here. Again, ghrelin is the only one that's, uh, that we're talking about that increases appetite. It's coming from the stomach. And this is a little counterintuitive, so try to stay with me on this one. It actually signals a neuron called neuropeptide Y-releasing neuron to release neuropeptide Y, which inhibits this particular neuron called pro-opio-melanocortin neuron. I'm going to talk about melanin in just a second, too. And when you inhibit this particular neuron, it activates appetite. It stimulates appetite. So, a little counterintuitive. I, I understand that. Peptide YY and white adipose tissue, they release different molecules, and that does the opposite. It actually inhibits the neuropeptide Y-releasing hormone, both of those two. All right, so let me tell you uh, just an interesting little story just so that you can remember this. Scientists at one point actually thought that leptin was going to be the magic molecule. The magic, they, could, they could develop a drug that would be cure obesity, right? It could cure obesity because it suppresses appetite, right? So they did a lot of research. They wanted this to be in pill form. Um, basically, this was going to be, again, the cure of obesity. Uh, but in fact, leptin actually also feeds back to adipose tissue and increases fat storage. So it was a no-go, all right? So that's something kind of to remember leptin by. Uh, again, leptin not only um, suppresses appetite, but it increases fat storage within adipose tissue, all right? Okay, so let's move away from GI physiology at this point. We're going to start to endocrinology. This is where your worksheet is going to come in handy. Um, before I get started, I want to make sure that everybody 
remembers a couple of different um, terms that I've used in the past. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the document camera, write this down here. Um, I want you to remember some of the difference between peptide hormones and steroid hor hormones. We're going to be going through some of these hormones that are either peptide or steroid hormones. Okay, so peptide hormones include things like arginine vasopressin. And with these peptide hormones, usually they are um, hydrophilic. They have receptors on the plasma membrane. And many times they're metabotropic, meaning they're G-protein coupled. So usually when the hormone binds to its receptor, a cascade of events occurs and the response is usually very fast. It's very quick. Within minutes, you'd see a response. Now remember with arginine vasopressin, water channels are inserted into the apical membrane allowing for increased water reabsorption in the kidney, in the collecting duct, distal tubule and collecting duct. Steroid hormones, on the other hand, remember those take about 24 hours. So usually what happens is steroids are hydrophobic molecules that don't have receptors on the plasma membrane. These molecules can freely move through across the plasma membrane into the nucleus. And its receptors are usually transcription factors that initiate protein synthesis. Again, slow response, usually protein synthesis and uh, expression takes about 24 hours. So peptide hormones are fast, steroid hormones are usually slow, okay? The other thing that I wanted to just mention is we have talked about exocrine glands and endocrine glands. Oops, endocrine, Oop. endocrine glands. Okay. Exocrine glands, like the pancreas, um, basically deliver molecules into an open space, a compartment, or when we're talking about sweat glands, uh, deliver uh, molecules to the skin, to the outside of the body. Endocrine, oh, and we've talked many times about acinar glands. Like I said, pancreas, salivary glands are perfect examples. Endocrine glands, these are our glands that actually secrete hormones and deliver it directly into the circulatory system where they travel through the body and then find their receptors elsewhere. All right, pretty good. So just a few terms that I think will be important. There are couple of questions on the final exam pertaining to these terms. So I want to make sure that we go through it one more time and I'm going to switch back over to our presentation here. All right, so this is just an overview. I'm not going to be going through too many of these. Some of them we won't be talking about except here, um, but in just a second, we're going to start off with the pituitary gland. I call this the Cadillac of all glands, the master gland. Okay, the pituitary gland has the anterior and posterior lobes, and we'll actually be going through most of these hormones coming from both the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. Again, this is um, the Cadillac of all glands, the master gland. Um, and I'll be going through this in more detail, so don't worry about, you know, um, writing everything down now about the pituitary gland. Um, we'll also be going through uh, some of the, the features of the hypothalamus. Um, this is where the production of vasopressin and oxytocin come from, and they're delivered uh, through, it's basically transported down these long neurosecretory cells, but you'll see that these are also uh, secreted from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Okay, so we'll talk more about that in just a second. We'll be also be talking about the thyroid gland, what is thyroxin, triiodothreonine, 
and calcitonin. Uh, we won't be talking about the thymus in this class, okay? So if you take an immunology class, you'll, I'm sure, be going through the thymus. Uh, basically, they secrete certain immune cells, uh, immune molecules um, that pertain to, again, immunology. Uh, usually, these are most active when you're um, a child, but then it undergoes atrophy during adulthood. All right, so we won't be talking about the thymus, but we will be talking about the adrenal glands. Talk about epinephrine, cortisol, cort uh, corticosterones, and aldosterone again. We will not be going through too much of the uh, gonads. I will be talking about uh, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone uh, briefly. But if you'd like more information about reproduction, I highly recommend Dr. Laura Moro's uh, reproductive biology course. It is excellent. So um, I will give you a brief kind of overview of some of these uh, sex hormones. But again, if you want more information, I highly recommend Laura Morrow's course. All right, so we've already talked about the digestive tract and the kidney, but I will revisit some hormones in addition to renin. Uh, erythropoietin, which actually helps promote the formation of red blood cells. And we'll be talking about calcitriol. So some nutrition students may be very interested in calcitriol. It's coming from the kidney. It actually helps to promote absorption of calcium from the small intestines. So we'll talk about that hormone. Parathyroid hormone. Uh, these, are, these are actually um, glands that sit on the, the thyroid gland, and they participate in calcium regulation within the blood. And then the heart atrial natriuretic peptide we've already talked about with the kidney. Adipose tissue is releasing leptin. We'll talk more about the pancreatic islet cells and insulin and glucagon. And uh, melatonin. The pineal gland actually within the brain secretes something called melatonin that uh, is responsible for sleep and wake cycle. So usually melatonin is released in darkness, and then it is inhibited during daylight hours. So uh, we won't be talking about that in detail, so this is the only time that you'll be getting this information about the pineal gland and melatonin. But otherwise, this is just an overview of some of the hormones that we're going to be discussing. So let's start off first with the pituitary gland. All right. The hypothalamus is uh, this, the area that sends endocrine signals to the pituitary gland. And like any uh, of some of the different um, molecules that we've been talking about, it is very important in maintaining homeostasis within the body. So again, one of those major themes of physiology that distinguishes it from other disciplines. Okay? So, here is um, a very nice image that gives you the location of both the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. All right, you can see that it's very close to the optic chiasm. So if those students that actually took the lab were able to dissect the brain, they know exactly where that optic chiasm is. It's in very close uh, association with the optic chiasm. All right. Um, what I think is very interesting is there's a lot of disease states that are associated with tumors of the pituitary gland, okay? And some of these tumors um, were very difficult to um, treat at one point in time. Now, I think it's fascinating that a lot of surgeries can be done uh, on the pituitary gland just by kind of putting you... Um, uh, um, what do I try to sell? Hardware, right? Uh, um, tweezers and, and instruments, instruments, um, actually into the nasal cavity. They can just go right through your nasal cavity and actually perform surgery. You can see how very closely associated it is with the nasal cavity and perform um, surgeries on the pituitary gland. So going into detail, let's talk about the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. 
So again, very closely associated with that um, optic chiasm. What I'm going to do here, here's the brain. This is the anterior side. This is the posterior side on the, the back of the head. All right, so if we blow this up, you can actually see here is the hypothalamus. And then these two lobes right here are the pituitary gland. The one anterior is called the anterior pituitary. And posterior to that is obviously called the posterior pituitary gland. Now, what you'll notice right away is that there are these long neurosecretory cells that only go to the posterior pituitary. All right? These are called the supraoptic nuclei, paraventricular nuclei, and these are actually sending signals to the median eminence for delivery to the anterior. So these green, these two green structures again are neurosecretory cells. This is actually where vasopressin and oxytocin are produced. They're produced in the hypothalamus, transported along these long neurosecretory cells, and then delivered into the circulatory system in this area, in the posterior pituitary. Okay, so a question that I could ask is if I transect or cut only the neurons in this area, in the um, hypothalamo-pituitary portal right here, uh, and I'm only cutting neurons, you can tell me, you'll be able to tell me that only those uh, hormones that are released from the posterior pituitary will be affected. Okay. So, let's talk a little bit about the anterior pituitary now. The anterior pituitary usually secretes a hormone. I'm sorry, we're up here at the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus secretes hormones that are delivered to the median eminence travel down the vessels of the hypothalamo-pituitary portal vessels into the anterior pituitary gland, where then it initiates secretion of a different hormone. Okay, does that make sense? Basically, the hypothalamus secretes a hormone that travels down the circulatory system to the anterior pituitary where it then stimulates the secretion of a different hormone. These are all endocrine cells. All right, you can actually see the optic chiasm here too. I forgot to point that out. All right, so a couple of different mechanisms. Um, just want to make sure that you have the anatomy down, just the, the basic anatomy. Let's go ahead and talk first about the posterior pituitary one more time. And I'm going to talk about more in detail uh, ADH, or vasopressin, and oxytocin and what that does. Okay, so again, we've got the um, supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus. These are neurosecretory cells. Both ADH, which is vasopressin, and oxytocin are produced here and then transported along these long axons to the posterior pituitary where they're released into the blood supply and they can travel throughout the body. Now, you already know this, but I have to say it one more time. Arginine vasopressin is also called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. It's released from the posterior pituitary travels to the distal tubule in the kidney and the collecting duct. It is a peptide hormone where it binds to its receptor. It's GS coupled. Those uh, aquaporin channels, aquaporin 2, are then inserted into the apical membrane. And now you have a pathway for water. Water can then be reabsorbed, and you can produce a very concentrated urine. 
So if that is, if what I'm saying right now is very foreign to you, please review that section in the kidneys, right, in the renal section. All right, but we haven't really talked about oxytocin. Oxytocin is also secreted by the posterior pituitary. Uh, it is a molecule that actually um, is part of a positive feedback mechanism. This is a classic positive feedback mechanism. All right, so usually um, the classic example is used during birth. All right, so usually when a woman is in labor and she's giving birth, um, she will have contractions of the uterus and stretch of the cervix. What that does is it tends to send a signal to the hypothalamus to release more oxytocin. Oxytocin then increases contraction and dilates the cervix, which actually promotes the secretion of more oxytocin. You can see how this amplifies the response, right? This is a true positive feedback mechanism, and it continues until a major event like birth occurs, okay? So that's one of the classic examples. Just realize that oxytocin is part of a positive feedback mechanism involved in labor, okay? Uh, all right, so it also is uh, responsible, too, for e uh, ejection of milk uh, when a woman is nursing. All right, so let's go on to the anterior pituitary. Again, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, two events here. First of all, you have these neurosecretory ner neurons that are going to release one signaling molecule into the capillaries of the median eminence. It's going to travel down the hypothalamo-hypophysial portal vessels into the anterior pituitary, and here's the key, where it then stimulates cells to secrete a different hormone. Okay, so that's why when you take a look at your hormone worksheet, for the anterior pituitary, you actually have two hormones, all right? One hormone, just for example, this is the corticotrophic releasing hormone. It's coming from the hypothalamus. It travels down that hypothalamo-hypophysial portal vessels until it reaches the anterior pituitary where it then promotes the secretion, it stimulates the secretion of ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And we'll get through to that in just a second. I'm just trying to tell you this is why it's organized this way with the anterior pituitary. All right, so going back, how does everyone feel? Right? Pretty good? All right, so that's kind of the layout of this master gland. Um, let's go ahead and go through some of these molecules. Uh, we'll be talking about TSH. These are the thyroid hormones. That's thyroid stimulating hormone. ACE, these are the hormones coming from the anterior pituitary. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. We'll talk about growth hormone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, prolactin. Okay, prolactin is different from oxytocin, by the way. Prolactin is involved in milk production, whereas oxytocin is responsible for milk ejection during nursing. Okay, so that's, there's a difference there. All right, now the only time I'll be talking about uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone is here. All right, we're going to go into more detail on these other hormones in just a second. Melanocyte stimulating hormone is responsible for skin darkening in certain organisms like amphibians and reptiles and fish. This gives uh, organisms the capability to camouflage themselves. They can change their skin color, right? Which is really interesting. Um, for us, uh, this hormone is responsible for not only protecting us against UV rays, 
Um, but also, as I actually mentioned earlier, it has effects on appetite, right? That pro opio uh, melanocortin neuron I was talking about earlier, okay? All right, so that's the only time I'll be talking about melanocyte stimulating hormone coming from the anterior pituitary. All right, so let's go through these hormones in a little bit more detail. The first one, thyroid stimulating hormone, okay? You can see that on your hormone worksheet. Thyrotropin releasing hormone is first gonna come from the hypothalamus. It's gonna travel to the anterior pituitary where it's gonna promote the release of thyroid stimulating hormone. What that does is it thyroid stimulating hormone travels to the thyroid where it triggers the re release of thyroid hormones. Talk about thyroxin and T3, triiodo threonine. All right, so um, with these thyroid hormones, the main idea here is that you are having effects on metabolism in your body. It actually sensitizes your cells to epinephrine, makes your cells more sensitive to epinephrine, increasing metabolism. All right, the next one, adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. It's corticotropin releasing hormone that's released from the hypothalamus that travels down that those portal vessels to cause the secretion of ACTH. And the whole idea here is ACTH is part of the stress response. It stimulates the release of glucocorticoids, cord, ah, gluco, glucocorticoids like um, cortisone. Uh, uh, cortisol. Also be talking about follicle stimulating hormone. I'll talk both about females and males and luteinizing hormone. Prolactin stimulating the development of mammary glands and milk production and growth hormone. So with growth hormone, let's go into a lot more detail. I'm going to talk about growth hormone first, talk about some of the pathophysiological states. Um, growth hormone in particular is stimulated to release by the, the hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone. That's not real original, but it's easy to remember. Growth hormone releasing hormone, comes from the hypothalamus, travels to the anterior pituitary, where it then promotes the secretion of growth hormone. Now, one thing that's really important to remember with growth hormone, it's coming from the anterior pituitary, is that the action is mediated all through insulin-like growth factor, or IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor. So, for instance, if you block the receptors from uh, the, let me say that again, if you block the receptors for insulin-like growth factor one, you essentially block the entire growth hormone action. Okay? So, this whole cascade of events, too, is inhibited by somatostatin. I don't know if you remember when I was talking about entero-like chromaffin cells before. Entero-like chromaffin cells are also inhibited by somatostatin. And at the time, I said, just remember, somatostatin inhibits everything. Okay? Same here. Somatostatin is actually going to inhibit the effects of growth hormone. So when growth hormone is released, it basically promotes the release of IGF-1, which then travels and all of the action of growth hormone is mediated through that particular molecule. So what does it do? 
it actually acts as the opposite of insulin. It elevates blood glucose levels. Think about this, it actually is very, it's ready energy. The more glucose you have in the blood, it's like currency you have, it's ready energy. It stimulates gluconeogenesis, getting more production of glucose, and it blocks glucose uptake by cells. So again, it's the opposite of what insulin does promoting the utilization of fatty acids as energy instead of glucose. You can see that that might promote also a ketoacidosis. And there are developmental effects. It stimulates RNA and protein synthesis, promotes growth of tissue, especially cartilage and bone. And one thing to remember, it also works synergistically together with thyroid hormone. All right, lots of information about growth hormone, also stimulated by that appetite um, cell or appetite molecule that I was talking about, which increases appetite. It also increases the production and secretion of growth hormone, ghrelin. All right, so let's talk about some pathophysiology. What happens if an individual does not have the capability of actually producing growth hormone. This doesn't happen today. If someone is falling below the growth curve, uh, they're given medication, they're given growth, human growth hormone to help them grow. All right, but back in the day, um, this is probably the 19th century, before we realized you know, what growth hormone really was, um, Individuals that didn't have the capability of producing growth hormone were normal weight and length at birth, but didn't grow properly through childhood. So as adults, they actually only grew to about three to four feet tall. They had a very juvenile appearance. And again, like I said today, we treat individuals that are falling below the growth curve with human growth hormone. This is called pituitary dwarfism. Now this is very different than uh, achondroplasia, which is um, what I think that uh, individuals that have achondroplasia, achondroplasia actually prefer to be called little people, right? This is not the same disorder, okay? This achondroplasia is actually um, has to do with uh, connective tissue. Okay, so um, again, this is called pituitary dwarfism caused by a lack of growth hormone. All right, what's the opposite? Gigantism and acromegaly are two um, disorders that actually are caused usually by a pituitary tumor. With a pituitary tumor, these individuals are producing way more growth hormone within that's outside of the normal range. All right, this is an overproduction of growth hormone and how do we distinguish between the two? Gigantism is a, a pituitary tumor that's caused during adolescence, during puberty. And the example that I like to use is Andre the Giant, right? Princess Bride, I see that movie. Uh, Andre the Giant actually did um, have a pituitary tumor during adolescence, during, during pu puberty, and he actually uh, was a gigantic person. Um, you can see here that uh, he grew to, I think it was like seven feet tall. Um, but unfortunately, all this massive growth actually had effects on his heart and he did die uh, premature death due to heart disease, okay? So it causes a thickening of the mandible. Oh gosh, we are out of time, geez, I could talk forever. Okay, just before I go, hold on just a second. The difference between gigantism and acromegaly is acromegaly is actually a pituitary tumor after puberty, and it only causes thickening of the cranium and the jaw, the lower jaw here, as you can see in this picture. So do know the differences between gigantism and acromegaly. I'm sorry I kept you longer. 
Um, but I will see you on Wednesday. Jeez, that went fast. Hi. So Andrea wanted to meet you and me at some point this week. Okay. And Valeria? Yes. Okay, Valeria. When are you free? Um, let me look at my calendar. She said all your appointments are booked until 2020. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'll try to, um... She's not free Tuesday and Thursday also. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, I may have to have her come on Monday. Next Monday? Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I'm not here, but... Okay. I mean, she said if I wasn't going to be there when I met you, she'd set up two meetings, but we're really trying to avoid that. Okay. So so she's not available Tuesday, Thursday. Right. Maybe Wednesday would work. Yeah. That's what I told her. Okay. But yeah, I have a class right after this one, like okay. I have a final, and then I'm done for the okay. rest of the day. So um, I think, um, let's, let me check my calendar, okay. and then I'll send you all in. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Thanks, Megna. Sorry. Hi. Hi. I just have a question sure. about our um, project. Sure. We have multiple clips that we're going to string together, but okay. can I show you one? Sure. Just to see if we're like on the right track. Yeah. It's not about like a specific mechanism. Okay. It's kind of an overview of the digestive tract. We did a horse as an example. Oh, I love it. Okay. Yes. Should I show you just in case? Sure. Or you think it'll be sure. Okay? okay, let's see. Oh, she is. Are you asking Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Where did you get that? We made I painted it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's hilarious. You made that. Hmm? Oh my gosh. So we have like kind of little interesting facts about each thing, but it's more of an overview. I love this. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay. Oh, we were worried if we gosh. like if we went too broad and we didn't no. do like one specific like physiology of the GI right. track, but it's, no. you know we were talking about the GI track. Well, no, I so. love yeah. this. Did you all know that I'm taking over Marsha Hathaway's um, historical perspectives of the horse? Yes, and oh, I'm completely revamping it. It's going to have some physiology in it. Oh, cool. Cool. I might ask you if I can use that. Oh yeah, please do. I yeah, seriously love it. Okay, you have some guest stars too. So. Oh my gosh, I saw the cat. Yes, the that's Simon. <laughs> that is Simon. Oh, that is so okay, cool. creative. I yeah. I love that. Okay, cool. I okay, good. It. We were, oh, we were sure if we did too broad of a thing, or if we needed to narrow it down to like one physiology. Remember, concept. it's only three to four or five minutes. Yeah, yeah. and so we'll be about that. This yeah. is perfect. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah. We're good. Thank you. I have a couple other questions. When is yes. this sheet? You... Not until Friday. Not until Friday. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, Wednesday, you'll get the yeah. rest of the information, okay. and then we'll. No. So for the final exam, yes. um, should we just focus on that study guide that you give us? Yes. Because like I know there's like other information like about the teeth and stuff. I was going over videos last week. Yeah. So, like, we need... It's not in the study guide. Should we study that stuff or no? Uh, there are some things outside the study guide. I better oh, be very careful. Okay. Okay. So I would say focus on the slides first. Okay. And then the study guide kind of helps you put everything together. Gotcha. Yeah. Good to know. yeah. Okay. And then I was wondering about, do you know anything about chameleons and like MSH? Yeah. Is yeah. That how, of course. Is that That's how exactly they, how okay. it works. Yeah. I was curious because they can so, change their colors yeah, so um, quickly. Yeah. Melanocytes and. Um, um, those melanin um, actually is really important in frogs too. Okay. And there's some mechanisms that involve like GS coupled proteins and, mm -hmm. and cyclic AMP that are responsible for darkening and lightening these. Yeah, it's all mediated okay. through melanocyte stimulating. Hormone, sure. All right. Well, cool. thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Great. So I just wanted to go over the like final option because I'm yes. still a little yeah. confused. So on Tuesday, can you come in and take the final and take an Yeah, on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Yes. You could do both. Yes. Okay. You so. can do you can separate it. You could do it all on one day. Yeah, either way is just fine. And what you'll see is on Wednesday you'll sign up for um, the final one day or the other. And then you'll find uh, you'll sign up for the retake one day or the other. So again, you can separate it or keep it together. And what if you sign up for a section on Wednesday and then like, can you change your mind? Or you can, but then you'll need to send me an email and I'll have to, because um, I just want to make sure that I know like who's going to be there. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's not a big problem, but I just want to make sure that I, my list is, because I will be making sure that the people that sign up are actually in the classroom mm -hmm. and I'll have, 
uh, the extra credit assignment, whether you do it or not, you're going to write your name on that sheet and turn it into me, like I said, whether you answer the questions or not. So I'll know exactly who's in the class taking the exam. Sounds good. And are we doing the final first and then any retakes? Or yeah, so always the final will be the first hour and the retake will be the second hour. So if you plan on doing the retake, just come at 2.30 instead of 1.30. On Tuesday? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, either day. Yeah, so they're both between 1.30 and 3.30. Again, the first hour will be the final, and the second hour will be the retail. Okay, perfect. And it's in this room? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's in this room on Saturday. Oh. And then on Tuesday, it's in B45 or Tan Hall. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. I will write that on the, I'll put that on the home page today. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I emailed you a while back about changing the top hat grade for October. Oh, yes. Hour. Okay. Yeah. Let me just write that down. I'll put it in my computer, mm -hmm. and I'll fix that as soon as I get back. Yeah. Okay, October 4th. And your last name? Demuth, D-E-M-U-T-H. U-T-H. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will get that done. Okay. Sorry, thanks Thank for the you. reminder. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. I figured it just got a little lost. Oh, I know. <laughs> the details sometimes get by me. So, right. yeah, it's thank okay. you. Hi. Did you do this email about Tarkovsky's to the cystic fibrosis? Uh, yes. 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 Uh, In fact, I was talking one. to another colleague about it, too. Yeah. So that is really something else. Yeah, I haven't yeah. read much about it. So it I actually just, sounds like it's three different mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, um, it's molecules. It's a course or treatment where, as far as I know, they're trying to utilize uh, one of the drugs to, I believe it's like pull the defective um, channel to the surface and then treat it and then release it. That's why they use three drugs. Oh, wow. I could be wrong, but that's what someone reviewed it and listened to it because I was like, I'm, I'm not. That's <laughs> amazing. Not that in depth and yes. knowledge with this. But um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you about is it okay if I take the final on Wednesday? Um.